we are the last event, the second day. This today will be a bit more technical, a bit more less general, a bit more specific. So that goes over certain data formats we apply, uh, how they are implemented, over specific ethical and privacy things. Um, and we're going to start with uh, Professor Ulrich Hoppe from the University of Duisburg Essen, who is a learning analytics researcher um, in his group Collide. Is it called Collide? Yeah, we say Collide, but Collide. anyway. Okay. Yeah. Collide. And he will give a presentation about beyond the um, obvious advanced analytics to and applications in educational contexts. So I'm really uh, grateful that you are here with us. Thanks. And um, later on, we will also have a connection to the LASI uh, global, to the global LASI that's organized in Harvard at the moment. So they will have a chapter, and we have a short chat with them. Tell them what we are working on. They tell a bit about us and so on. So Ulrich, yeah, thank you, Hendrik. Indeed, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, we are so close, but we do not meet so often in our close context. We meet maybe in places like Indianapolis or so, but um, not so much in the place where we, where we are usually. Um, I'm also happy to see some known faces in the audience. So for one, I have to apologize that she has just heard my more or less the same talk uh, two weeks or three weeks ago yeah but anyway so uh, beyond the obvious um, yes what I wanted wanted to do in this talk um, say the rationale behind it is to show what you can do when you go just beyond um, the the standard analytics dashboards with some descriptive statistics Indeed, I think there is much more to do, very interesting challenges, and I hope to share th some of these with you. So um, this was my way this morning. Usually I try to, to kind of tell you a bit where I come from. In this case, it's easy. As I said, we are close, although we may, we could indeed make use of this uh, local proximity more than we than we do. So it indeed took me a bit more than two hours to come here. This is the region that I come from, the Ruhr, the industrial area, um, the old industries. Um, our university, uh, one of the newest, if not the newest university in Germany, because it was founded by a merger of two exist former, former universities in the, in the cities of Duisburg and Essen, now about 40,000 students. and. Um, a quite wide spectrum of faculties. Interesting for you may be the composition of our department. We, we are a department that is in itself interdisciplinary. We have uh, uh, 17 professorships, uh, out of which 13 are in computer science and four in psychology. And we also run a joint study program on um, interactive media and cognition. And also, we have other study programs that are more just computer science oriented. Um, so this is where I come from. The research group Collide, yes, the name Collaborative Learning in Intelligent Distributed Environments was coined in 95 when I moved uh, to, at that time, Duisburg University. And uh, what we are doing in the group is, um, in general, what you could describe as knowledge and learning technologies. And uh, here you see some of the, the buzzwords that we have been, uh, have been uh, looking after. And um, a new word, a new term that is very important for us is, of course, learning analytics. So much about the context. So learning analytics, a definition of learning ana analytics. This is one of the possible definitions common denom denominator for all types of measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners, about their contexts, with the aim of understanding and optimizing the learning and also the learning environment, environments in which the learning takes place. Um, there is a relation to educational data mining. There are people, education, the educational data mining community was formed maybe a bit earlier than the learning analytics community. And in my understanding, if I'm asked about the difference between learning analytics and educational data mining, I would say uh, uh, learning analytics is more open in the sense that, um, that what you do in learning analytics usually involves human 
human stakeholders at different levels, whereas the educational data mining people, not all, but most of them, they, they use the analytics to optimize intelligent tutoring systems in a quite closed loop. Uh, so I would say this is closed loop learning analytics and, and what, what we do in more in the, in the LAC community is open loop learning analytics addressing, addressing humans in the loop and not just the learner and the system. Um, of course, there are big data issues, big data issues also around MOOCs that many people are interested in these days. And um, from a computer science point of view, there, is very in, there are very interesting opportunities also for work on, on non-trivial algorithms and computational methods uh, on the level, for instance, of networks or visualization. Very interesting challenges, I think, a very rich field. Um, looking at the, um, at the learning analytics conferences that we have seen so far, I have been at the last three, so not but, but the first one. Um, and uh, I would say the main um, applications that you see there are on the one hand prediction of students at risk. That's typically in a university academic context. You have the files, the records of the students and uh, you want to, to filter out those students that, uh, that may need particular attention to, to, uh, to support uh, or to avoid failure in the academic system. Um, we also see monitoring on learning platforms, platforms such as Moodle, like supervision support for teachers or say aggregating data for other, per often also research is the, is the first intention to do this type of monitoring, so empirical research questions. Um, in the intersection with the more um, known work on tutoring systems, I see open learner modeling. This may not be so evident, but in the intelligent, intelligent tutoring community, there, there have always been people who said, oh, we, ha we have these student models, let's open up these student models, either to the learners themselves or to the teachers or to other stakeholders. This is, for me, very much in line with, uh, with the learning analytics approach. Uh, we have seen discourse and argumentation analysis, similar to what has also been done in the CSCL community. So these are, I would say, interesting, interesting lines of research in terms of the applications. First, I want to give you an example, which uh, has not been, uh, not been elaborated in my group, um, a group uh, between several institutions in Berlin has such a tool that supports analytics on a learning platform, not only on Moodle, but mostly the, the applications that they have are on Moodle. Um, so you enhance a learning platform, a learning management system with analytics. This tool is called Lemo. Here is one of the publications about it. Um, and this is uh, one of the, say, typical prototypical types of system where you where you plug in analytics to a learning platform which makes a lot of sense um, and uh, this is where I would say the obvious starts but you can al already go a bit beyond the obvious there I mean the ob very obvious th thing is you would use things like Google Analytics or in an open way you might use Piwik and you just have do descriptive uh, statistics on the on the activity data, participation meters, and things like that. This is of course the obvious. They also do it, so you can see things like that: participation metering over time um, uh, for different types of activities, for learners, for resources, resource access. But they, what they also do, for instance, is they do transition modeling so that you know what would be typical paths that the learners take through the, uh, through the materials, visiting one resource after the other um, or visiting one, uh, one location in the system after the other. So this is a transition system with probabilities in between um, and you can use uh, also, sequence analysis techniques to, for instance, find longest sequences that are still frequent. There are libraries that you can use there, and Lemo has some of these libraries included. So, 
here you see how you can really go from, from the very obvious to things that are already a bit, a bit more, a bit less trivial. Um, now, for the rest, I would organize, I try to organize the landscape a bit using uh, a three perspective approach. I see that there are three um, different, uh, significant, significantly different perspectives on learning analytics. One is um, based on the activities, activity analysis. Uh, this is what we have seen, for instance, with the LEMO tool. You have the log files. The logs are essentially action logs. You have a process-oriented type of analysis. Uh, you use sequence analysis techniques. Uh, time is a very important parameter in these models that you derive. Uh, some people have used uh, techniques such as process mining, developed in Eindhoven. Um, and um, for instance, in our community, Peter Reimann, he has been, was one of the first to adopt such techniques, which originate indeed from theoretical computer science. Um, so you would look for action patterns, you would look for plans, there is, of, of course, a history of that, and you can do it here also in this area. A completely different perspective is looking at the, at the products, at the artifacts. Um, of course, we are particularly interested in artifacts that are produced by the learners themselves, because anything that we have prefabricated could be analyzed um, easily before. So it's not so much, uh, say, uh, learning object metadata, but it's uh, how to analyze the, the emer as we call them, the emerging uh, artifacts or emerging learning objects. Uh, what we can more or less easily analyze and where we have a, a variety of methods is of course textual uh, artifacts or textual parts of artifacts. You can look for things such as semantic richness. You can combine that with tagging. So you use user input to semantically analyze or semantically classify, and you use tag analysis. And then we have um, the, the, the network perspective, the network analysis perspective. Um, many may know social network analysis, for instance, the Wassermann Faust book on social network analysis. Indeed, these techniques do not only apply to social networks, they also apply to networks, for instance, of actors and, and artifacts. But you wouldn't look into the artifacts. And also, you wouldn't consider time as part of your network models. I think this is a very important distinction that um, yeah, I want to bring to your awareness. You would say, oh, that's, you, can also use, you can also do network analysis, social network analysis, based on log data. So if you know that people have accessed the same resource, you connect them. But once you do social network analysis, or also actor artifact network analysis, you take your data, aggregate this data in a time window, and what you get, the model that you get, is no longer time dependent. Uh, of course, you can then look at time series of such models, which is very interesting, and we will see an example of that. Um, but in first place, what you get when you apply network analysis techniques is a, uh, a model, a graph that ignores time. There are exceptions, for instance, citation graphs. Citation graphs or reference networks, so when you refer to other things, there is usually an, an inherent notion of time in, in, in that the references usually go back in time. So there is an implicit notion of time. But usually, you can say these, the network analysis view is really different from the activity or process-oriented view, which is very important. So my first example now will be um, the application of network. So we have seen activity analysis. I would say this is something that you could see with the LEMO tool. I want to give you one example of network analysis now which also includes, as a second step, the evolution of networks. So you want to bring in time, of course, at some point. And the second example will be artifact analysis. So the first is, um, is uh, an application of network analysis techniques uh, to one of my courses. You could call it a SPOC. Uh, that term was created by, by Armando Fox from Berkeley a small private online course. The point is that it uses 
a lot of the, say, uh, uh, resource enrichment strategies that we have with MOOCs. So, for instance, we have quizzes, we have uh, uh, collaborative wiki writing, uh, we have uh, uh, peer reviewing in this course. Um, but we wouldn't call it a MOOC. It's neither really open, it addresses certain given learner communities, nor, um, nor is it massive. Um, but we use very similar ingredients. So this is a, a master course that we have analyzed here that I give once a year. It's on modeling and designing interactive systems and educational environments, so very much in this area also. Um, usually about 40 participants. Um, and um, we used to have uh, a, a lecture, a traditional lecture, plus an exercise with also hands-on or often you prepared the hands-on experience, then you came to the exercise, discussed it. Um, but, um, but we replaced, we decided, also because of participation issues in the exercise, we decided to completely rep replace the exercise um, by um, online activities and uh, all this on, on the basis of, Mu of Moodle. And I use now in, the, in, the, in my lecture, I use uh, from, from time to time, not always flipped classroom designs. So because I have now a collection of videos for the lecture, so I can uh, 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 provide the videos on beforehand, uh, but not always. So it's partially flipped classroom and very rich resources. Um, so we have teacher-generated content and we have student-generated content. We have teacher-generated the lecture videos, slides, reading materials. Um, we have quizzes, quite non-trivial quizzes, I would say, quite challenging quizzes, also a strategy that you find in MOOCs. And we have one serious game uh, in the area of ontology-based learning. And uh, then we have the student-generated content, which would include wiki articles, concept maps created by the students, and also the peer reviews of the students. All this takes place on a Moodle platform that uh, we have extended uh, with uh, a video plugin that was uh, developed in, a, in an exam thesis. Uh, and we have uh, navigation tools that allow you to, to navigate between the vid videos and other resources. Um, so this is the environment that, um, that uh, this takes place in. So first, some very simple descriptive statistics, the obvious. Um, here you see the, uh, the users per day over the whole, over the whole semester. That's uh, one semester from mid-April. And this is uh, beginning of September. Of course, that's not all lecture period. This is the exam period. This is the exam period and this is the lecture period. And here the red line is uh, video access. Of course, what was quite interesting for us first was to see how the resources are used differently over time. You see these, this burst in video. Um, video. The videos contain all the core lecture elements. Also in, these, in the size that is usually, usually suggested for MOOCs, this is not a MOOC again, but we have up to, yeah, I think the longest are 25 minutes or so, the longest videos, but usually they are in quite short pieces. Um, and um, you see they are heavily, heavily used for, uh, for uh, exam preparation. I think I can show both directly. So first research question uh, that, we, that we have been looking at was, uh, the valuation of the different materials by the students. Uh, here you have um, statements about yeah, the course as a whole. It is seen, so the, uh, here you have the full agreement, this light gray blue and this kind of violet is agreement. So if you combine these two bars, then you usually have the positive, the positive reactions. So very positive reactions to the course being perceived as interactive. Uh, videos are, are very much appreciated. Um, the forum a bit less. The wikis very much. And uh, here you see a more 
specific question how the how the material is evaluated for exam preparation um, and you see that the highest scores although all not too different are for the videos and the slides so for teacher for teacher uh, generated material but you might add these two for instance here you see this is quizzes quizzes um, would also this is uh, still quite positive agreement quizzes um, and also the wiki articles would also be used quite uh, frequently and would be appreciated very much so this is this is uh, our findings about about just the usage of materials uh, now we we wanted to look into the um, the internal group structure and and how it evolved over over the course indeed we have in this course um, students from three programs and we wanted to see uh, if there are different patterns of usage in the different groups one is an, a group of international students um, often with an original bachelor level background uh, in engineering and then we have uh, our our computer science applied computer science students and we have this interdisciplinary group with psychology um, interactive media and cognition they are all in this master course um, so more or less every group at least 10 uh, between 10 and uh, and 17 or so um, so we wanted to analyze resource resource access patterns over the course of this lecture um, just to to study the different behavior of of these groups and maybe also to learn about uh, about the role that the different role that that the resources uh, play over time so first if you want to model this situation um, what do you have to consider I mean we have the resources and we have the students um, from a network analysis point of view this can be transformed into a uh, bipartite graph what we call an affiliation network in network analysis uh, so we have affiliations between students and resources we wouldn't consider connections between the resources at this level and we wouldn't connect uh, we wouldn't consider social relationships at this point um, this gives you this typical structure of an aff affiliation network that's a famous one uh, the southern women network that you also find in the Was Wasserman Faust book but practically what what we have here gives us the same the same picture and we derive it from the log files but once we aggregate the log files into such networks as I said there is no more no no longer a notion of time in the representation now it's a standard question how you can find so-called sub communities in such a community uh, subcommunities or cohesive subgroups as I prefer to say cohesive subgroups are characterized by being more densely com connected among each other than the rest of the community and there are several algorithms for for finding such uh, cohesive subgroups for instance modularity uh, is one is first of all a measure but you can use the measure um, to also to optimize a partition of the group um, if you use such algorithms it's very important that you know about the logic of the algorithm some algorithms would just give you partitions so by definition they would just give you separate subgroups they would not, not overlap just because the algorithm works like that other algorithms may give you overlapping subgroups depends on what you want but often uh, allowing for overlaps between cohesive subgroups is very interesting because people who participate in several groups may have very important roles in the whole community like like we say brokers or bridging roles between the communities um, and there is one one method that um, allows you to find overlapping overlapping groups in social networks that's the clique percolation method that's a quite interesting one um, in the in the normal case of a of a one mode network this is how it works so for instance here you take a, a clique 
of, uh, of four that you start with and you look if you can extend the clique of four uh, by another node. For instance, here in this transition from here to here, this was the clique of four, a completely connected subgroup. And now you add this node and you delete this node here. And so you percolate this clique through the graph. And as long as you can exhaust a portion of the graph, you just, graph, you just add these, these nodes all together. And you can do that from different starting points, which may give you indeed overlapping, overlapping uh, subcommunities. And now we have a different situation. We don't have a normal uh, uh, graph, uh, but we have a bipartite graph. And there is an extension of, of this method also for bipartite graphs, which is a bit more difficult to imagine. But I would just appeal, take it as an anal analogy. You can use this method and also apply it directly to the bipartite graphs. What you could otherwise do, you can always, what we call, fold a bipartite graph into a unipartite graph. Say, that would mean, for instance, for the students, you would connect those students who have used the same resources, so they would be connected by or mediated by the resource. You can always do that, but then you lose information, and it's often more interesting to stay in this richer representation, bipartite representation. So this is what we have done here. And before I show you the results, I want to show you how we do that, what kinds of tools we use when we, we are doing that. And um, we use for these purposes a workbench that we have developed in a recently finished uh, European project, indeed not a technology enhanced learning project, but a science analytics, I would call it a science uh, analytics project. CISOP stands for um, an observ observ observatory for science in society was in the program science in society and um, it was the idea was to go beyond standard um, yeah scientometric bibliometric techniques that are for instance used when you are assessed by your university administrations or so um, and the idea was to look into the networks that you are engaged in to maybe better understand your involvement with communities and with society. And, and as, a, as a backbone, as a technical backbone, we have created a workbench that, that encapsulates several known techniques of network analysis. Um, it uses a visual metaphor, the pipes and filters meta metaphor, to describe what we call analysis workflows. And the different analysis components are are implemented as agents in a multi-agent environment. We have, we have used different implementation language, and we can still use different implementation languages for these agents. Um, but mostly what we are doing on the network level now is implemented in R. I guess several of you will know the R scripting language for statistical applications. But for instance, when we add, when we connect this to, to Content analysis on texts, we have also used Python and LTK for several components. Um, so it's possible to, to mix different, even the different perspectives that I mentioned in the beginning in these analysis. And there is a, a middleware on which, on which this resides that's um, uh, what we call a blackboard architecture and it uses a tuple space for the agents to communicate. So we don't have agents communicating directly with other agents. They all communicate to the, uh, through the tuple space. This, by the way, was the, the consortium of this project. Um, and now I want to give you a demo of this workbench, and then we will see the result that we have created for the analysis, the subcommunity analysis of our course. So uh, it runs online, but uh, it's easier if I start the video here and we can just, oops, if we start, the, if I start the video here and we just follow the video. So you see a web-based, a web-based front end. You see here all the different tools that you may use, starting with input tools. Here you can access a data repository that is, resides on the server. You can also access local data that you have on your machine, uh, but then it's of course not very, uh, reasonable to share if you want to share it's better to put things on the 
on the server. You have several data converters. We support standard formats. For instance, PyEG is a well-known tool. We, tool. we support the PyEG format. We support the UCNet format and uh, other formats. Here I load a workflow that, um, that uh, does uh, a, that indeed does exactly this uh, extraction of a two-mode network using the click, click percolation and then a forced, forced directed clustering on this network. It's a simpler network that, than the one that we are going to look at after. This is just a publication network. And then you get results that you can also directly um, uh, view through your browser. So we, we have a second, uh, usually then will be a second tab in your browser. You switch between the editor of the workflow and these visualization windows. In which you in which you then see your uh, your data. In this case, the um, the sub communities were colored. You see the overlaps. And here, what I what I do, I change this workflow by adding into this analysis or integrating into this analysis workflow also the calculation of centrality measures, degree centrality, just the number of connections that a node has, and also between a centrality which tells you how important this node is to interconnect other nodes in the network. Yeah, briefly. So we see this is now, this is now changed. And uh, if we run it again, we see the colors. I should explain the colors. Once such a module is in execution, it will turn uh, yellow. If it's executed, it turns green. And um, so in the end, everything should be green. If it turns red, it's not so good. Then we have a, an error in the execution. That can also happen. So now you see um, the same picture. And now you also have additional information on the nodes about the different uh, degree, uh, centralities, between us and degree centrality, that you, can, that you can also view as properties of the nodes. So this is how, how this workbench works. And uh, we have, as I said, now applied this by click uh, percolation method to our, to our community, which gives us, um, for different time slices, and now time comes in, for different time slices, we get constellations that describe the resource usage distribution in, in our learner community. For instance, this, this was one situation. Um, here, we were. That was a time when intelligent tutoring was the new topic. There were some older topics. You see, all the 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 colored clouds are subcommunities, and they can overlap. And you see, this com these communities they contain students and resources, reading materials, etc. Very interesting was that at that point in time, we had three students heavily interacting with videos. And we didn't really know that was many other connections here are uh, just reflections of the assignments that we have given to the students. This was not. It was quite interesting. So we had a subgroup of students in, in this time slice looking at, um, at uh, videos. Um, and that was during the lecture. Um, so what are uh, now research challenges? If we, if we apply these techniques to, to such research intensive online courses, um, there's one thing um, that, um, that uh, we are doing now with certain project specific applications is that we, that we try to embed um, workflows that we have applied successfully and that have uh, that have given us interesting insight into the environments. You can do that through a dashboard, um, but you would not have users using the workbench directly, for instance, uh, uh, say supervisors. The workbench is for, for analysts. If you want to use the workbench, you really need to know about the concepts, for instance, the network analysis concepts, etc. But you may want just to convey the results through the platform. And also, you may want to feed that back to students. So these are general points. Specifically, for this sub-community analysis, 
um, there are very interesting questions when you look at the evolution of such groups. I mean, now you have time slices, you have networks in different time slices. How can you say a, a, a community um, has survived? Maybe it was here, it has grown a bit, it has been contracted, some people have left it, but it's still the same community. The community has been split here, or it died out, or a new community was born, two, two uh, communities have been merged. These are now very interesting questions once you have the basic time slices with the, with the networks to answer such questions for, um, for the evolution of communities. And for this purpose, uh, we can generate, on the workbench, we can generate these swim lane diagrams. These are in still bimodal, bipartite uh, diagrams. So you have um, the squares are the resources and the circles are the students. So here you see one group of student, students. Um, this is a student group and this is a group of resources. Indeed, the, the symbols now refer to groups, not to, not to individuals. And you see that there is a continuity here in this student group, and, but they have uh, some changing access to resources, which is natural for the, for the lecture. But the, but the group as such um, is more or less stable. So here is, and there is a local continuous interest in resources by this one student group, but this changes after some period of time. Um, or here you see a lot of variation in the resources and groups being just stable for, for part of the lecture period. Um, here we have a a quite continuous, a quite continuous group, both resource-wise and uh, and uh, regarding the student group. And this is the exam period. Here you see you see variations, lots of variations, because everything is important, and you need to uh, uh, you need to to take it into consideration. So what we found by this analysis is first of all that there are certain standard behavioral pat patterns. Um, also to do um, to some extent with the with uh, the task assignments that we have given to the students so at least it's positive if the, if the method really reflects that back to you that the task assignments are visible as constellations in the community we have seen this unexpected grouping of students around videos we have seen continuous interest in the wiki articles not only during the time when the wiki articles were written that wiki articles are student-generated content, um, and also not only during the peer-reviewing phase. Uh, we have seen that videos are particularly used for the exam preparation. This is also something that we had already seen in the, in the descriptive statistics, if you remember, but we could also see it here. And we have seen that there were different resource usage patterns for the students from the with the different backgrounds in terms of study programs, particularly during the, the exam phase. Um, so this is, this is more or less what the microscope can give you. Um, some of that is, is say, plausible, as you can explain, you could, you could predict that. Other things are, are um, unexpected. Um, so this was my example for a network analysis. Um, so there are quite sophisticated techniques. I would, not only because I'm originally trained as a mathematician and I'm always happy to see non-trivial mathematics in what we are doing, um, but I really believe we should exploit the potential of, these, of this rich inventory of, of algorithms and methods that we have in network analysis. One of the big challenges is, of course, how to marry that with time so that we can bring in the factor of time. You see, with subcommunity evolution, that's a, it's a question that, that, that has to do with time. Um, the next point that I want to address is artifact analysis. Uh, talking about time. Uh, no one, yeah, OK. So, and uh, what I want to show you is the extraction of semantic networks. So. 
in a way we come back to networks, but the starting point is textual artifacts, from textual artifacts that are created by students. And this comes from, a, from a, uh, an ongoing European project called Juxta Learn, um, with the, the coordinator is the Open University, Milton Keynes, Swedish partner Linneus. We are here behind RIAS, that's uh, uh, an institute, a non-profit institute that we have created between the university and another institution. And um, so the point of this project is what you could call second order inquiry learning. We assume that students have acquired some knowledge in fields of science and we want to deepen um, um, this knowledge um, and consolidate this knowledge by having the students um, explaining and presenting this knowledge in the form of videos. So they create videos on their understanding of certain science domains. And this is uh, on the part of the system and environment. We have certain, uh, say, conceptual models taxonomies containing threshold concepts, also expected uh, hard uh, issues, stumbling blocks, as we say, misconceptions uh, could be related to that. Um, so we have some, some uh, say, a semantic space in which we use to, 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 uh, to uh, also both to direct and to monitor what the students are doing. And, um, and this happens around these videos. In the first part of the project, of course, we did not have um, student-generated videos generated by our own students. So what we did in the first round was we had workshops with teachers and students. These were flipped uh, classroom-style workshops in which the students presented their understanding to the teachers and discussed with the teachers in were selected topics from chemistry, biology, and physics, or with one topic. And we had protocols from these teacher-student workshops that we have analyzed using um, the tool AutoMap, which uh, was developed at Carnegie Mellon University by the CASOS group, Kathleen Carley. Um, and there is a corresponding tool, Aura, for visualization. So here we have just used uh, tools that, that, were, that existed. Um, and uh, we have run the workshop transcripts, transcripts through these tools. These tools generate from the texts, again, multimodal uh, maps. And the modalities, the, 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 the different categories can be, for instance, you can identify actors, domain concepts, pedagogical concepts. Of course, this is not just, you don't just get that all automatically. You have to build up these vocabularies interactively with some intellectual input. But once you have them, you have what they call a metathesaurus, uh, then you can apply it to, to different textual artifacts. So first, of course, there is the typical pre-processing that you have with these text analysis. Um, so throw out stop words, uh, stemming or lemmatization. Um, then you do the meta thesaurus and, uh, and synonyms also. And then comes in the lower part the, um, the visualization. So, <clears throat> so this is, these, these are some of the inter intermediate steps. Very important. You classify the concepts that you, that you detect. And uh, then you can visualize, <coughs> visualize and this may give you a situation such as this one. This is indeed a, re a real um, product from, from one of these workshops. The blue network is a domain concept cross domain concept network. So that's a unipartite network that just shows domain concepts that are closely connected. Closely connected here means the automap algorithm runs a window over the texts and whenever two words, you can adjust the window size and whenever two words appear in the same window, you will, you will establish a connection between them. Uh, you could have weights of the connections, but here they, they, you don't see that. And then the gray part is the connection of actors, in this case, only students to these, to these uh, uh, concepts. I mean, students are mentioned in the protocols 
and you can see when a student appears in connection to such a concept. So you can see, for instance, here that this student has been really active. Yeah? And um, we have this one also. In another version, we also had the teachers and the researchers involved. And was not, not such a nice picture for the teachers, but maybe it was a flipped classroom, so the student were exposing, students were exposing, so it was also clear that uh, the students would be more active here. Um, so what you see, um, you can extract such, um, such uh, semantic networks from texts. And now, since we did not have our own videos, um, but we wanted to study uh, the, the interactions around videos, we have, uh, we have used external sources um, to extract uh, information from video comments with the idea to reflect by this, um, through these networks, the understanding of the domain that related to this video and, and possibly also to detect misconceptions. And we have mainly used Khan Academy videos. Also, many of these, no, all of these videos are also on YouTube. So Khan Academy uses YouTube to store the videos. So you can find the same videos there, but the comments that you find on YouTube are quite different from the comments that you find on the Khan platform. The Khan platform is moderated, and so there is kind of quality control. It was interesting to see the differences. I will not elaborate on that. We have also done that now. And we have used the same approach um, for analyzing video comments on the Khan Academy platform. And here we have added a new category of concepts. I mean, you have, we have these domain concepts. We may have places. Here, pedagogical concepts would probably not be such an important class of its own. Um, but we have general concepts. And, but among the general concepts, we found there are, there's an interesting subclass, like for instance, can you explain the difference between X and Y? Difference between would not be a domain concept. It would just be a general concept. Or can you explain? Explain is a general concept. So there are words that signal uh, some information need or, or, or some problem of understanding on the part of the student. And some of these words, they would go with, with single domain concepts or others would establish relations between domain concepts. And we have used this on this sample. We have used a sample very similar to what we have also done in the, in the workshops. Um, and from this sample, we have extracted, just using AutoMap, such, um, such uh, relationships now between signal concepts and domain concepts. For instance, here you see um, difference between diffusion osmosis. The problem now is if you just use AutoMap and what it gives you, um, everything around difference between is on the same level. So you could say, oh, maybe it's just the difference between osmosis and solution. But more, much more likely, we, we would say it's the difference between osmosis and diffusion that was the problem here. So you cannot separate out. It's kind of you have a multiplication. And um, you also have unary concepts like def definition, give me the definition of a membrane, etc. All these indicate kinds of problems of understanding. What we have done to, to, to overcome the problem with the, with the multiplication around these binary signal words is we have introduced combination nodes. And these combination nodes, this is something that we have, have now implemented on our own, um, following in the first uh, part using the same vocabularies that we had developed with AutoMap. But now we have a new approach in which we also use an, um, an ontology that we have extracted from, from uh, Wikipedia. Um, this is just ongoing. Here you see um, the, the size of the combination nodes tells you how often this occurred. Here you see potential difference voltage was often uh, seen as a problem to distinguish. Or a very famous thing, weight and mass, also something that very often was uh, what is the difference between weight and mass? And now you get that. So what is, what is automatic here? Um, the analysis is fully automatic. The vocabularies, the signal words, are just predefined manually by us. 
the, uh, the domain vocabulary we have taken over first uh, in the first step from, from our automap analysis. But now, as I said, we are, we are using uh, um, a, a new ontology that we harvest from Wikipedia. Uh, so that is also, and, and here this is projected back to the original context. So here you see, for instance, I finally understand osmosis, thanks Khan. And this is the internal representation after the pre-processing. And um, so you have to understand, understanding in connection with osmosis. Um, you could say, oh, that's a positive statement, and we interpret it as a negative statement. But on the other hand, it shows there was a problem of understanding with the concept of osmosis. It was at least before. And um, so here, um, so explain pressure, confusion about osmotic pressure, etc. So you see how this works and how you can project it back into the context. So we will embed this now into the JuxtaLearn process in different phases of the JuxtaLearn process. Um, on the one hand, to support teachers in their monitoring, but there's even a, a longer term point here. You have kind of your curricular plans and your assumptions that your curriculum builds on. Um, and you may see that what you, what you think the students should understand and what their model should be is not what in reality takes place. So you may use such information also for curriculum revision, for instance, for, for ordering things differently or, or uh, way, uh, giving different weight to different parts of the curriculum. So this brings me to the last slide. So we have seen one example of quite detailed classroom monitoring. We have seen <coughs> what is possible through such a microscope. Big question, of course, how about privacy data protection? I heard that you are also going to, to address this. Um, we have seen uh, what you can do with artifact analysis around learning artifacts, emerging learning artifacts. Um, I hope I could convey to you that, that if you want to do new things, if you want to create innovation, it's always interesting to cross the border lines between just doing artifact analysis. And here we have seen artifact analysis was connected to networks. We have seen networks interpreted in, in, in time series. Um, and I think we need more of that. And another point that I have not, that I've only mentioned at, uh, in, in, in one situation, I haven't really elaborated on. Um, the question, of course, is also how you, how you embed these, these techniques into your, into your environments so that certain stakeholders have an adequate access to this information. So um, we have here more seen the, the analyst's perspective, how the more or less uh, analysis experts would do this. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is one example of such an embedment from a recently finished project, uh, FoodWeb uh, training, training um, um, people in the uh, food industry. Um, and here you can see this is more or less like a a teacher or teacher supervisor uh, uh, dashboard that would allow you to to view constellations of certain groups and you see you can if you want you can still embed the workflows here and show them but you would not longer no longer manipulate the workflows for instance on that level um, yeah that's it thank you for your patience Interesting, inspiring presentation. Are there any questions in the audience? I guess Sander. Indeed, uh, thanks for the, for the very interesting presentation. A, a big topic always is, is once you have these networks or this, this uh, network visualization of your, your analysis, how to best communicate that then to students and teachers, which you've touched upon as well. Do you know of some best practices or of other good ways to, to convey this without sort of I have to give a large story over them to understand. I mean, when I said beyond the obvious, um, it's now a bit I'm trying to avoid <laughs> a direct answer to the question. But when I said beyond the obvious, I, um, 
I wanted to plead for first also doing non-trivial things really with the data. Uh, and of course, particularly when you do that, it's even more difficult to feed that back. A, a simple participation, uh, say histogram or so, is quite easy to interpret, I would say, for a teacher. Uh, that's OK. Uh, for instance, these bipartite subcommunities are very difficult to interpret. That's I wouldn't, I wouldn't project it to, to, the, to the actual stakeholders. I mean, this is currently for, for us as researchers. Um, there is a discussion, ju discussion just yesterday. I had a discussion with my, my colleague, Andy Hara. We had a, a, a PhD exam together. And, and he advocates showing the information just in context and not in a dashboard. So, I mean, the dashboard would typically separate out the analytic, the view on the analytics, and um, the altern alternative may be, um, for instance, you have on your learning platform, you have a view of the group, and then you embed the group information directly with, uh, with say, the list of, of, of people that, that, that is in the group. Um, so, um, uh, that's, that's a discussion. I mean, the standard answer is, of course, the easy answer, well, make a nice dashboard. That's what most people now would do. Um, I would still say that's not too bad. If, I, I would still advocate that it is reasonable to, to, to particularly for uh, supervision purposes. In, a, in, an, in an earlier project, we created the term teacher's cockpit. I mean, to have something like a teacher's cockpit so that a teacher could have all the currently important, relevant information um, visible, maybe on one screen, say with fo possibility of focusing on, uh, in into certain things. Um, so yes, it makes sense. Um, for the learners, we have also discussed that. We are now, for instance, in an ongoing project, um, GoLab, access to remote laboratories. There is the idea of providing learners with such dashboard views for self-reflection. But for the learners, I would rather take Andreas Harra's arg argument. Maybe it would be better to show information in context. Um, for the teachers, I think if we have well-prepared and well-designed, from a user interface point of view, well-designed uh, teacher cockpits that make an, may indeed make sense. We had a, a, a specific project in the area of classroom argumentation systems in which we had such a teacher cockpit that has been used indeed by, by many teachers, um, which, and it was usable, yes, it was usable, yeah. It's, but it's an open question still, I would say, yeah. Uh, I asked the same question to Andre Hara last year, so hmm? Oh, you know his, his position on that. Yeah. He, he would really advocate just embedding the information in the context. Yeah. Well, I, well, I've got a slightly re related question, I think. Because what, what, what you've shown, I, I think, is you have a set of data. Then based on the set of data, you uh, design or develop a, a number of analysis techniques, and then you're going to do the uh, interpretation. But does this have to happen all the time? Each time you get a new set of data, do you have to to go, go to this uh, to this process? Because basically, uh, uh, the, the the analysis techniques you use, they are let's say inspired by the by the data, and then mm -hmm. the interpretation is then inspired by the analysis mm -hmm. techniques you use. Mm -hmm. So do you have to go through that process every time you have a new? I mean, that, that brings me, if I understand correctly, back to the workbench. Um, I mean, the workbench uh, is for, let's look at this here, just this picture. Um, what, what would be the typical usage of the workbench? I said, who would use it? These would be typically analysts. They, they for instance, behind, Behind this, or behind, yeah, even behind the former transformation, there may be an R script. So there are several researchers writing their own R scripts, but once you have a rich library of such modules, you may no longer have to write the R scripts on your own. So, um, 
on the other hand, what you, what you do here with such a workflow is something that you would usually reuse. So you have like a, a, a workflow that is worth being conserved and being reused on different data or the next time slice of data. I don't know if it, so the point is it's not just data exploration. If you want to do data exploration, I don't know, maybe some of you have used Gephi is a very nice tool for data exploration. If you have seen, for instance, Dan Southers, he, he often presents with Gephi and he's a real wizard using Gephi. That's data exploration. That's one thing. But once you have a certain procedure, a certain recipe which you apply to your data, then you write such a workflow and then you can reuse it. And that's the first step. I don't know if this helps already in what you... Uh, well, yeah, you know, of course I, und mm. I understand that. But then mm. I mean, that's, that's just the, let's say, the, 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 the algorithms that yeah. analyze the data. But the examples you gave, mm. for, for example, with the, 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 the difference mm. between, you have to do, uh, you have to input additional things like ontologies or yeah. certain terms, yeah. certain roles. By the way, we are mapping the, 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 what you saw with the artifact analysis, we are also mapping that to the workbench now, but this is not, not completed yet. But the, our tendency is all these recipes that we have, they, we would map them here, so we make these workflows tangible, reusable. Um, uh, yeah, that's a so, and then the next step, of course, is once you have such recipes, how can you, again, embed these recipes with your environments. And then the question is, when do you want to execute them? Uh, I think that you can do that on demand. You could even trigger that automatically when you want these uh, analysis recipes to be re-executed. The more difficult thing is, if you do it at different times with different time slices of data, how do you interpret this in between? I mean, we saw that with the sub-communities. This community evolution problem is really a, a, a very challenging and in just intellectual problem also. I mean, how do you define that? How do you define continuity uh, or discontinuity between your, your data sets? Um, but I think it's the first step to have these recipes. So you can have them, you can store them, you can reuse them. That's the first step. Yeah. I've seen that you showed the, the groups, the communities who are merging and who are dividing. How, how can you follow this in time? Yeah. Because maybe you could predict and, and, and give some uh, advice to the folks or students. Yeah. Um, first of all, how we follow them in time is just we, we, we separate the data or we aggregate the data over time windows and we shift the time window over the uh, over the I mean you have log files with times with timestamps and you always separate out intervals this gives you a time series of networks yeah and then indeed there's this question uh, how do you when you saw the, these um, these sequence di uh, these swim lane diagrams you identify communities in the different time slices. You need certain, the community will not be one-to-one -one the same, so you need certain, a certain fuzziness in the definition so that you can see, oh, the, the community has only changed a bit, it's still the same. So this is this one thing. Now you add another question, that's prediction. Um, can you predict the evolution of such sub-communities? That's another well-known problem in the network uh, modeling and network analysis community. It's called link prediction. Link prediction is not in first place for, the, for communities, it's just for links. But in a way, if you aggregate links, you would again find communities, or you could use community structures as basic information for link prediction. But I can tell you that link prediction algorithms have very, very low, uh, say, precision or reliability in the prediction. So, um, um, could, I mean, we have, we have seen these standard uh, problems that are also addressed from a, from a practical point of view, prediction of students at risk. Uh, imagine, I mean, what you typically do is you have, you have uh, uh, features, you, kind, you, 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 you featureize your data, and then you see, you can use machine learning techniques that tell you that certain combinations of features that, yet that you 
extract from your student record often go with failure of the student. So it's just a statistical uh, prediction and you may derive these patterns using some say machine learning techniques. There is no dynamic model behind that necessarily. Um, once you want to, I mean you might indeed use such microscopes as the one with the subcommunities if you if you want to look more deeply into your student populations particularly when it when it comes to looking at courses as we did here and then you may interpret the belonging to to certain groups um, in your way and probably you as a teacher will have some better understanding of what it means to be in this group at that point in time um, for instance, we haven't pursued this issue with the videos because it, it wasn't problematic and we only found it afterwards that students at some point completely unexpectedly were just gathering around, around videos. There we, 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 didn't, we didn't know why. Yeah. Um, okay, um, prediction is very difficult to bring it to a summary. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that we're time's up now. But thank you very much. A very good point. Um, we have uh, we have advocated. We had a workshop in which um, I also used this argument: if we do student tracking, why don't we do teacher tracking? Yeah, we can do it and using more or less the same techniques. Although, I mean, the numbers are different. And um, but on a Moodle platform, of course, you can also track teacher actions, and it's interesting. Yeah. I would Okay, thank you. Colleagues, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.